Now I want to take it from machine learning to our next topic in the financial technologies. We have two excellent speakers here with us that will tell us all about digital currency and fintech. Trisha Kemp is a general partner at Oakland, um, at Oakland Healthcare and fintech. She has over 15 years of experience in investing in financial technologies. And before that, she worked 11 years in big companies. Michael Casey is the senior advisor of the digital currency initiative here at the Media Lab. He was working as a journalist for over two decades in financial technologies for, within others, um, the, financial, uh, the, the Financial Times. Also, he has literally written the book about crypto technologies. So I look forward to this panel and would like to ask the speakers on stage. Okay, so uh, we are the, um, the gap between you know, the refreshments <laughs> afterwards, the classic last line. So we're going to make this a, a nice brief chat. We've yeah. got some rolling that we have to do. Uh, uh, th thanks very much, David, for that introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Michael Casey. I'm, my world is defined by blockchain. That's a word I think you might have heard once today. Obviously, a bunch of you probably know what this is, but often it is a technology that is still really quite nascent. And so I do find that we're talking to crowds sometimes that don't really understand what it is. But that's going to be a, a theme we'll, we'll deal with here. Um, you know, I, I personally think that it is a, 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 it needs to be thought about as the next wave of, of profound disruption in the uh, sort of the, the, the architecture, if you like, the infrastructure of our, um, you know, our digital economy, basically, because it just changes the framework. And we'll get to that in a little while. But, but fintech is, is kind of like the, the overarching theme yeah. in many respects. And it's quite a, it's quite a buzzword of the, at the moment. Um, it seems to be that everybody is, uh, wants in on it. But uh, Tricia, give us a sense of what the um, investment environment is. Sure. Um, uh, so, for, so I'm a general partner with the firm Oak HCFT, and we've done maybe 25 fintech investments over the last decade, let's say. Um, fintech investing, and the term fintech is, can be, you know, different definitions of, of what is fintech, but it has exploded over the last three to five years. So 2015, 2016, both saw numbers like, you know, nine billion in each of those years, a little bit off fourth quarter 16 in US and Europe. And that's about 10 times what fintech investment was in 2010, 2011, just so you understand. So it's greatly exploded. You know, about 40% of those investments have been in both the lending portion and in the payments portion. So they sort of been focused in certain areas, but you know, the amount of money that's gone in has got, you know, it's greatly expanded. A um, couple other interesting facts to think about when you think about fintech is the valuations have, uh, are, have remained frothy and are just starting to fall. So we kind of track how many down rounds, I mean, you can pull it all up in pitch book. And you know, general tech companies, 2016, I think the number was 19% were down rounds, you know, 81% were up rounds. You know, fintech, it's still well sub 10%. So they're all still having higher and higher valuations. Um, and you know, something like healthcare IT, you know, the portion of our business, is 30% down round. So the valuations have kind of started tracking down. So again, this is just kind of all interesting. It's still frothier than tech in general, even though it attracts a lot of tech investors. Um, uh, uh, but our expectation is it's going to start to fall. I mean, one other interesting fact that we look at is, um, uh, and again, is just of interest if you're thinking about a fintech company, is strategic exit is most uh, likely, is the highest percentage of exits. So if you actually kind of track it, you know, 27% of companies sell for you know, under $50 million. Of the other, you know, 73%, the vast majority, a percentage like 89%, sell between 200 and 600 and sell in a strategic sale to a big les legacy player. So this is very different than, you know, a direct-to-consumer Uber or, you know, uh, guilt or whatever it might be. You know, they are our strategic sales yeah. to legacy infrastructure players. You know, in the 200 to 600 million range. So that's kind of how the market has looked yeah. over, let's call it, the last five years. I mean, it's interesting that the, 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 the froth is there because I think that um, you know we can call that hype or yeah. we can call it 
you know, a sense that this something big is happening, right? Yeah. So I think that you get a, lot, a, a wave of interest in something when, when the word is out that we are doing something big. And I think in terms of fintech, yeah. you know, I like to, I, I try not to hype, but I do tell you this is the first time really in 500 years yeah. that, we've, that we've really <laughs> just tried to, to tackle and truly disrupt money, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So inevitably, the enthusiasm and the story and people like me who write books about it, we sort of help to breed the hype. But as a result, where, where is the value? Where, where, where are you guys looking to invest within this kind of rather, you know, like big vision picture, but there's actually yeah. going to have to be some, some real yeah. life opportunities coming to market in the next two or three years. Where are they? Well, um all right, so we invest in largely B2B companies, so we're not doing the next direct-to-the-consumer robo-advisor like a Betterment or a Wealthfront or trying to come up with the next mobile bank. So we think it's far less risky and actually easier, because of what I said earlier about valuations, um, to kind of look at the world in terms of all the financial services ecosystems. So we kind of frame it, if you think of all the stacks, you know, banks, payment processors, insurance companies, mortgage processors, asset management companies, capital markets companies, et cetera, they all have ecosystems in and around them, and they all have stacks from customer acquisition to onboarding to pricing to risk management to you know, account management to profiling to claims processing. They all have kind of legacy see infrastructures um, uh, that that is, is you know dramatic change is happening and why is dramatic change happening we all know you know cloud AI that we just all heard about you know data and data being used for AI is one of the most compelling cases is within financial services um, uh, industry, within the financial services industry, you know, mobile, all those stacks have to have now mobile and instant uh, uses. So all those new technologies are being brought to bear up and down those stacks. So what we like to call this is kind of um, enabling the ecosystems, right? So we think one large change and one large trend that's going to happen in, you know, 17 through the next decade is you're going to see everything from uh, you know, think of your insurance carrier. I mean, we all see the Geico and the Progressive commercials, but besides that, you know, you get eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper and envelopes in the mail once a year, and you're priced once a year, and um, your engagement is once a year. I mean, you're not, you know, there's no, there's no mobile engagement. There's no online pricing. There's no real-time pricing and pulling in, in data on you. There's no, you know, take the photo of the fender bender and send it in and get your claims processed immediately. So you can kind of go stack by stack across all those, and there has been money put into payments and into banking, but you're going to have solutions up and down those stacks being brought to bear by you know, cloud-based solutions, data, mm. et cetera. I, I, stack is a word that I've, I've suddenly realized as I left the journalism world and came into yeah. the tech world. So, it's a word I love because it, it allows me now to think about uh, yeah. you know, business and, 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 the, and the architecture of where we build yeah. uh, applications in an interesting way. So I think really again, a little biased, but I think the, of uh, the blockchain actually as the ultimate underlying stack, right? It, yeah. it, is, it yeah. is the bottom stack because what we're doing here, you know, for those of you who, who, who may or may not know much about it, I mean, we're grappling with a fundamental problem, right? So there's this core issue that is, again, 500 years we've had this centralized trust model whereby uh, banks and, for that matter, other institutions have acted as the intermediators of our trust problems. We've relied upon these institutions to represent us when we haven't been able to exchange in a peer-to-peer -peer way for whatever reason we don't trust. So money is, is, is the most important application of that. It's, we, we, we trust each other to transfer cash with a stranger because we've got this one bearer instrument that we all understand is the conveyance of the value that's being conveyed there. But once we move into you know, a remote environment, uh, how does the world know that the dollar that I'm spending, I'm not double spending somewhere else? The monetary system requires some understanding of how that, that exchange happens, and therefore we have to invest the trust, if you will, in a bank. And this goes back for 500 years. So now what blockchain does, which is the underlying technology that enabled Bitcoin, is to create a decentralized architecture, a distributed system in which that trust can now be deferred to a consensus mechanism that's driven by cryptography and a bunch of other things. You know, there's, there's some game theory involved, but it's, it's proven itself. Bitcoin is actually the first use case, if you like, of this. And as much as it's, it's had its hiccups as 
uh, as a digital currency, people tend to think like, well, why do I want something that's, you know, I've got my dollars, and they think of Bitcoin as a digital currency, and that's all it is. In many respects, it's the first use case, and it proved itself because it hasn't been hacked. It has not been destroyed. The ledger is complete, even in this decentralized environment. So once you start to recognize that, you can see it as this important foundational layer. Like Mark Andreessen, when he was sort of first confronted with Bitcoin, said something like, wow, this is the distributed trust architecture that we always wanted when we were first rolling out you know, the, the internet, that this was, this was the stuff that would truly allow peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And if we'd had it, maybe we wouldn't have these behemoths like Amazon and others that end up re-centralizing control, right? So, so there's something quite profoundly um, opportunistic about this moment. But it's, it's very, very early days. Um, and so it, it, building that architecture is, is, I think some people compare it to the internet, it's something like, you know, maybe the early 90s, right? We still haven't got to, uh, we maybe we're grappling with email, but we certainly don't have the World Wide Web and we don't have mobile you know, smartphones and we certainly don't have Uber and everything else yet, right? Th those equivalent things don't yet exist. But what's also interesting is because I think of this recognition that the, tr that the, um, the disruption could be so big and the opportunities are so large, we are rushing forward with attempts to build applications on top of it. And you know, you, you heard you heard you know the, the, the presentation from Cuomo, Cuomo way earlier, which is a really interesting idea that you use this immutable ledger now to be able to sort of provably transfer title and exchange mortgages in ways that cut out all of that reconciliation. But the question is, what architecture are you going to build that on? And yeah. it's it's there's some interesting ways around that. You know, there's private blockchains which aren't quite as disruptive as these decentralized models, but all of that's coming along. And the, and I think that. It's going to be very interesting to see how this interplay between what are ultimately like fintech applications yeah. and the the rollout of the of the uh, of the of the underlying infrastructure is. I mean, the opportunities are huge. Um, at the Media Lab, we're looking at things like uh, as a project we're doing that Mark's actually involved in. Mark Weber, the warehouse receipts, and so this idea that you could really bring into our financial system. Is individuals and entities who have been locked out of it because that centralized trust architecture is difficult to get into. There's huge requirements to do so. And the, the case of warehouse receipts of these farmers that we're looking at in, in Mexico who have will get a receipt for the grains that they submit to a warehouse, which should be they should be able to use to then get a loan to be financed. But because there's no way to prove that this hasn't been double spent, that this same receipt hasn't been re-pledged three or four times, they get locked out of financing. Banks don't want to finance them. So what if we place that into this immutable record that nobody can change, this decentralized trust architecture, you start to see the possibilities. Mm -hmm. so, so these are the things that we're exploring in this, in this realm. And I think it's, it's, it's very exciting. But as I say, we're, we're kind of at the very early TCP IP stage of development. But nonetheless, in, in, in FinTech itself, some of them being built on centralized systems, at yeah. this stage at least, there's a lot going on. What, what, are, you, what, what are some of the well, other well, big trends? Well, and I would are, just add to what you're saying. So, so you know, Blockchain has tremendous promise, as we all know, and, and tremendous use cases. There are all these other things that may or use cases that may or may not use blockchain that within, within financial services need to be fixed. You know, I gave the example of insurance earlier. I'll give an example of, you know, uh, identity authentication. You know, when you show up to open a bank account, we all know you have to show up. You have to bring like a utility bill. You have to bring, you know, two forms of where my address is. All this sort of stuff that is just. 30-year-old technology that needs to be changed. Um, invoicing, CFOs. So CFOs, you know, they receive payments in in seven different ways, including, you know, dog and pony, and they send them out eight different ways, and it's all, you know, electronic AR and AP. It's all very, um, uh, you know, old, antiquated, is what you'd say. So that there, so blockchain has tremendous promise, but there are also use cases and solutions and services that are needed kind of up and down these stacks. Um, we could talk about you know, the digitization of payments, which everybody's familiar with, and I don't know if you know the numbers, but consumer payments, um, and this is going to be approximately right, but let's say 2005, 41%, and you guys all look too young, so you're not remembering all this, but 41% of consumer payments were digital, you know, 60%, 59% were cash and check. By 2015, that had completely flipped, and it's close to 77% digital, you know, 30% cash and check. 
B2B payments are still well over 50% via check. So US companies send around, they're 70% of the check volume in the United States, they are sending around checks in something like 55% of the cases. So you're gonna have you know, the continued digitization of consumer payments, and you know, many people think 2017 is when we're all gonna start putting our, our leather wallet away and start using our, our phone as our full wallet because we all want you know, one touch purchase, et cetera. We'll see if that happens, but many people think it's gonna happen. Um, but you're gonna have this continuation of the digitization, you know, not only up and down these stacks, but across payments and then across B2B payments, which is a much you know, larger volume than consumer payments. So, so digital, digitization of continued payments, which brings up what I kind of say a, a third area of lots of promise you know, in 1718, which is what I'd call reg tech, regulatory technology. So it's fraud, it's risk, it's identity, it's compliance, it's know your customer. Um, I don't know if anybody saw that the, um, there's a Wall Street Journal article recently, you know, HSBC has you know, 8,000 people in a tower in Long Island City, New York, and they're literally doing, you know, manually, I'm gonna call it manually, doing background checks. You go open up an account, they are Googling your name and making sure you know, you're not the, the ax murderer or the terrorist or whatever it is. I mean, it's all, that whole world of compliance is now somewhere between 15 to 18% of banks' day-to-day -day costs and as everything becomes more digitized and as all, we all have more and more devices, the, those needs and what your identity is and you know, the positive history, which is your, I'm sorry, the negative history, which is your background check and your positive history is that, you know, Patricia Camp paid this utility bill for this many years at such and such address is all going to start to be organized in a fashion such that it becomes easier. I'm glad you mentioned identity. That, that's one of the, the, the areas that we are very interested in uh, as a potential blockchain application. One of the reasons why is because you start to think about, well, there's a couple of things. One, one is, one is um, that compliance problem uh, it could, could be better resolved by the transparency of the data that resides in the yeah. blockchain, right? So in a real-time way, I can start to look at where my flows are. Right. I might anonymize that data because we don't necessarily want that data to be publicly identifying people. But at the same time, if I can sort of we talked about machine learning and, and big data earlier on. If there's a sort of a big data analysis of what a blockchain flow system looks like, you can start to manage nodes rather than individuals. Right. And that's an interesting way to think about this because what, what obviously, India is facing this massive problem right now with this, you know, this um, demonetization, or they call it, yeah. they, you know, they're, they're sort of moving away from, from cash. And um, it's, a, it's a massive backlash, partly because people depend upon cash as an anonymous form of exchange. And there's some actually kind of human right almost to this capacity to exchange. And so Bitcoin's very interesting because it says it is digital cash. It's not, it's not a new way to do digital banking. It's literally digital cash. You, the an anonymity that, that obviously gets, its in gets it in trouble on the one hand is a very important feature as well because it allows for fluidity of commerce. So once you start to think about that architecture, you then think of how might we apply compliance to that? How, what, is, what are the things that we could do with this information? And there's all sorts of interesting applications around you know, uh, uh, KYC, and you know your customer concepts, right. that, or digital identity concepts that, that don't necessarily identify people. So right. knowing your customer is not knowing their name and their social security number and what the utility bills is, but it's knowing that this particular entity, whoever it is that you're dealing with, has this provable record of transactions that makes them a good credit or a bad credit or a high risk or a low risk. Mm -hmm. And you have this sort of more automated interaction between financial institutions and the customers. And then you start to see, okay, so we could have potentially a safe world where these, these flows are managed in a way that doesn't in, you know, undermine the financial system and we can identify risk from a kind of a pattern perspective, but also protects anonymity and privacy and these things which are becoming increasingly important. And hopefully that is the sort of thing that, that really reduces that massive compliance risk. Because by the way, that compliance problem is, is, is creating a global problem, which is this de-risking issue. There are, there are countries all over the world that have had remittance corridors shut down because banks are terrified about being sued for somehow you know, unwittingly funding a money launderer. 
right. uh, or, a, or a worse, like a terrorist you right. know, operation. Well, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw it, but Western Union was fined, it must be a month ago now, like $600 million, you know, it, it, not an insignificant number because right. their AML, and money laundering techniques were not And the answer is to put up all the more compliance officers Correct. and or shut down operations with whoever they see risky, which is either way is going to cause the same thing because that just adds to cost, which means the barriers to entry to the financial system are higher. So we have a, a duty for the sake, as, as far as I'm concerned, to the yeah. global economy to resolve this problem. And I do think this is where a lot of the great opportunities yeah. lie. Yeah, no, and it's a, bit, a little bit related to the last panel where, you know, where is data and then, you know, good use of data, AI, applicable? You know, financial services is a, is, is a great use case. I mean, just as we all now walk through the security things at the, at the airport, right, you know, 99.9% .9 of us who are being double checked before they let us hope, open our, you know, Merrill Lynch account, right, and it's only the 0.1% that are in trouble, you know, a, a lots of AI and lots of data can be used to make all of this a lot smoother. And right. um, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a terrific match of use case. But a lot of it also, in my mind, is, it is leading us eventually to um, a complete reorganization of, of what we consider to be a financial institution, what a yeah. bank. I mean, what do you, how long before, you know, we, we start to think, I, I love asking these questions. What, when, when, will banks be the same as they are now in 10 years, 20 years time? What, what's, what's the kind of glide path for this from that big picture perspective of that? When do, we, when do banks die, I suppose, is the question. Yeah. And I'm not wishing that upon the banks, yeah. although I quietly am, but no, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, uh, so I don't know the answer, and I guess our investment you know, time horizon is kind of five to ten years, and what be, we're yes. trying to do is get them efficient enough right. Right, so that they can compete. Um, uh, I mean, it is very interesting, and, and Michael mentioned this, you know, the Indian demonetization. I mean, it's as if somebody in the United States said, okay, every five, ten, and twenty dollars dollar bill is worth zero December 31st, right? And you all have to, and, and all merchants stopped accepting it uh, because they were trying to dramatically move that country to being completely digital payments. And they, they announced it, oh, they announced Shock it at the therapy, night yeah. of the U.S. election, November 9th or 8th, yeah. 8th 9th. Um, and, and they said, you know, whatever value of rupees as of 1231 are no longer of value, they're zero. And so you had this enormous, you know, Chaos. Massive chaos, right? So, what's my point? My point is that, you know, does something like that in the United States, does this digitization continue, right? Does the concept of a bank, how many people walk into a bank, you know, if you never, no longer have to walk into the bank with your utility bill to show who you are, then, you know, what happens? You know, you're going to see dramatic change. You're obviously going to see dramatic change. I would counter, Michael, that it's people's money. So, I have always said, you know, it sounds great to have you know, Wealthfront and Betterment and Robin Hood and all these sort of things, that all sounds great when you have $5,000, right? If you have, you know, whatever number of dollars, you're handing it to Vanguard or you're handing it to Chase or you're putting it someplace, you know, there, there is, this is people's money. So yeah. I don't think it's quite the same as get rid of, rid of taxis and get into Ubers, right? I think it's, I think that it, I think there is a difference to this because there's a sense of security. There's a, a heavily regulated environment. I mean, you yeah. know, the, the, whole, the company has to be heavily regulated and licensed. So I don't think it quite shifts like other you know, industries because the, of the risk, risk of losing your fortune or losing your life yeah. are two, uh, yeah. to that, that previous panel are, are, are big checks on how far this technology can go but at the same, the same time you know yeah. there, there's, there's, a, there's a mountain that's slowly starting to move and I think yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how it goes we're going to call it quits because we actually both have to try to make it to uh, transport to get us out of here and further south so <laughs> sorry there's no other, no questions <laughs> but I hope that was interesting and useful to you to you all and, and thanks very much thank for, you for, for, for yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.